Hi, my name is Cassandra Ibrahim, and I'm here with Patricia Hines of the Alpha Art Gallery's 2020 Oil and Mixed Media Exhibition, Encounters. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I consider myself a painter. I've been a painter for a long time. That's after I had a career in the nonprofit world. I'm a, a mother, a widow, grandmother, I have a lot of grandchildren, very blessed with a good family. I'm uh, living alone with my dog and I've retired from my, uh, I would say, paying career. Mm -hmm. And I've been retired now for around 10 years and I've been painting full time for 10 years. But I painted beforehand, but never with the energy that one requires to devote oneself to painting, which is very arduous. What inspired you to choose oil as your medium? Many years ago, when I was in my early 20s, my father sent me an art kit, you know, one of these Grum Rocker art kits with board, canvas boards and paints and very bad brushes. Uh, but I opened it up and the minute I opened up the paint, that was it. It was something about the smell of the paint, the texture of the paint, I just fell in love with it. And I was drawn to it. And I've been painting in oils ever since. Although when I, uh, went to, okay, I, I had gotten married and then dropped out of college, but then when I went back to college, I went back to study art. And uh, I then used all the mediums that I could find and I took every course I could find uh, for my undergraduate and also for my graduate studies. And uh, I still, even though I did sculpture as my, uh, uh, my from my thesis, I was in ceramics, I did a, a, a very detailed sculpture technically about how to work with ceramics and fiberglass. Um, I went back to painting because I couldn't um, really do all the sculptures I wanted to do because I didn't have the room and I wanted to do art. So I went back to painting and I went back to oils and I'm very happy with oils. I, I like the viscosity. I like how you can put it on a canvas. It doesn't dry right away. It's manipulative. Uh, you can build up surfaces, you can uh, have the steel surfaces or build up surfaces. It's a very versatile medium. So I, I, I just enjoy it. And I enjoy painting. I enjoy the challenge of painting. Yeah, it is a challenge. A very great challenge. I think, you know, I think I, I've gotten something down and then I'll walk away from it, the canvas, and I'll look at it the next morning and say, oh, no, you blew it. You really have to get back at it and fix it and make it better. Um, it's, it's a constant act of refining and there's a constant tension I feel when I'm painting between um, excess and restraint mm -hmm. and how to be disciplined. It forces you to be disciplined if you want to do something that's worthwhile and I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful. I really liked your point. How did you become interested in art in the first place? I think I was always interested in art. Um, mm -hmm. My father went to um, NYU at night during the Depression, mm -hmm. and uh, he took an art history course with Jansen. Uh, he grew up in Hell's Kitchen. He had to work his way through college, mm -hmm. and uh, he had to have an art history course or a humanities course because he was a, an accounting major. Mm -hmm. And he took this, what he thought was a crazy course, and it changed his life. And he patterned me after the chance and model. When I grew up, I was always going to museums or historic houses. And we, if we went for a drive in the car, he'd say, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at the sky, look at the flowers, look at the trees, look at the ground. He nurtured in me the ability to look. And while I was looking, uh, I think, you know, I, I think they, I may have annoyed a lot of people because I, I have a tendency of staring because I look so intensely. Mm -hmm. um, and I always have looked and I and I, as I was looking I studied and I studied people and I studied things and I studied how things happened or how things changed. I was really conditioned to become an artist without even knowing it. When I went to college originally I was going to major in political science and economics 
yet uh, when I finished, I had a, a, an undergraduate degree in art history and, um, uh, and also major was, was uh, studio art. Wow. So I like history, I like art, but I did a lot of economics too. So I, I, I did dual, which was good for me because eventually when I had to earn a living, because it's very hard to earn a living during art, um, mm. I, had a, I had a very good liberal arts background and I could turn that background into a, a profitable living. That's really great. Who would you say is your greatest inspiration as an artist? None. I love art all the way from Lascaux to even contemporary. Yeah. And um, I do a lot of reading on art theory and I study, I still study a great deal. And um, I think read a lot of philosophy. And uh, I like to study different artists and different art because I feel that when I, when I go into a gallery or a museum, by studying art, I learn. And, I, and somehow it goes through my filter and eventually it comes out. It comes out constructively. Mm -hmm. So I, I like major artists. Uh, I like simple artists, artists who are not major. I have friends who are artists and they're not ma major name artists, but I enjoy what they do and I respect what they do. So I can't say that there's any one artist that I like or one artist I patterned myself after. Years ago, I liked you know, Van Gogh, but my taste had matured greatly since then. <laughs> and um, I like diversity. For example, when I cook, I'll look at a recipe and I'll do a recipe once and then I'll do the same thing, you know, I'll, I'll do that meal or that, that dish again, but never follow the recipe. And it comes out, it still comes out good, it comes out different each time. But I have to be very, um, very creative in my approach to everything. Different recipe each time. Different, I, I make different recipes each time. Never the same meal in the house. <laughs> I like that analogy. How do you choose your subjects for painting? When I was in high school, I was the, the class photographer. And I did a lot of photography. And I, I had a dark room and I did, we had the wet room that was not in digital. It was, yeah, this yeah. was centuries ago. <laughs> it wasn't digital. And so I did a lot of, you know, processing of the prints and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I knew how to do a camera and, and take pictures. And a lot of my pictures got into the yearbook and I got published. Mm -hmm. And I took the, the art of photography and I, as, as I started to paint again, when I, you know, when went back to school and I took pictures and I take pictures. I, I have a, a, a library on my computer of like 10, over 10,000 pictures, mm -hmm. I'm always taking pictures. And um, I, I delete the ones I don't like, but there's, there's something in, in taking the pictures and in staging the pictures because it's my eye. And initially it's how I view something and, and what I consider to be important and interesting. Yeah. And, and how I construct each frame that I take. And so I, I churn through my pictures. Most of them are, are memorized by now. But I get an idea in my mind about what I want and I'll, I'll go through all of these pictures. I'll make a compilation. And also I have pictures that aren't on my computer in, in books that I put together for, of prints. And I just go looking at the visuals. I'll pull together uh, you know, some ideas and eventually put together the, the people, you know, and, and construct a theme, and construct a picture, a narrative. Uh, when I retired from, from work uh, 10 years ago, my thought was that I would do painting half a day and writing the other half of the day, because much of my work for over the years dealt with writing and editing, and, I, and I'm a prolific writer, and I enjoy writing. And I figured, okay, fine, it's time for me to do the great American novel about the nonprofit world and what I've experienced and the people I've encountered and all the things and, and all the war stories, uh, you know, sanitized. And so I got out of work and I sat down and I started to do my painting. I couldn't write. I just could not write. Painting was just so consuming and I was so driven. I'm an A++++ person. Mm -hmm. And I was just driven towards the painting and I couldn't walk away from it. I had to work all day long on it and until I was spent, which is what I do every day. I realized, well, you know, 
one of the most challenging things that one does is to construct what you're going to paint. And, uh, you know, especially when you go to graduate school, you get out, you have all this knowledge and all these things, and then you say, well, what do I do? I mean, a lot of people say, well, what do I do? You know, and someone told me it would take you four or five years to get rid of all the graduate school stuff and find your own course and do things. And I was in the process of finding my own course of doing things when I retired, just going back into the mode. And then I realized that I was always interested in action. I went back and looked at my old paintings. So interested in people doing things. I realized that, well, instead of writing, I'm going to do my narratives and paint. And that's what I do. I put together originally four, five, six, seven, ten images, narrow them down, and then I refine them into one simple image that creates the story. So the editing process, before I do a, a drawing on a canvas, the editing process is, is essential. It's very much like writing process where you edit things out. I edit my images out. I edit my thoughts out. I edit out where I want people to go on the canvas and what I want them to say, what I don't want them to say. And so it's the process. Um, it's detailed, uh, it's well thought out, and it goes very fast. I, I don't uh, dawdle over it. I'd say, you know, I think about it as I'm finishing my last painting, and then eventually something comes into my mind, then I can go look for the visuals. I get the visuals, I edit, I do the things, and, and the process, the actual finishing of the process takes just a couple of days, not even a couple of days. But I know in my mind what I want to do, and I know really how I want things done, yet I leave it open so that when I'm on canvas and I'm painting, I leave open for the, the moment of when I say, no, this has to be different because it won't work that way, or it will work better another way. So it, it's, it's a constant process, constant thought process and constant thinking. And this goes back to my graduate school days and my undergraduate days. When I went to school, uh, I went to Rutgers, undergraduate at Douglas, graduate MFA at Rutgers. And I'm so grateful for the education that I got there. And one of the reasons I'm grateful is that I didn't get atelier style training. They didn't teach you how to paint then. They didn't teach you how to do things that then. The only person who really taught you something was Huey, and he taught you how to throw pots and do things, or do any, and not even print. He just taught you how to do ceramics and the glazing and everything. Everyone else was was mindset, and which was very interesting because it opened up my mind on a conceptual basis about how to think and how to plan and how to do things. It was fundamental to how I produce my work today. And so I, I, could, I could put ideas together, and I do now, but I had to teach myself how to paint. I'm still teaching myself how to paint, and I develop my own style. I develop my own way of painting. What is it about depicting human reactions in real life that drew you towards them as your subject in your paintings? Because it's part of my life. It, my painting is about life. My painting is about reality. Mm -hmm. I'm a realist painter, but I don't paint like a photograph because the paint is so important. The paint has to speak to the viewer because it's speaking to me on the canvas and where it should go and how it should be. I enjoy being with people. I enjoy understanding people. I enjoy studying people. Uh, I enjoy interacting with people. It's, it's like if someone's going to write a novel, or write a book, uh, or write a short story, or an essay, it's about life. Mm -hmm. And painting is about life to me. It's about the life I've experienced, the things that I've seen and I've done, the interaction I've had with people, and I, it's, it's about reality. I try to paint real, the reality as I see it. Why you chose to depict challenging narratives to your audience rather than a blissful or serene scene. Life wasn't meant to be easy and it's not easy. Uh, it, it, you, you can ask a two-year-old who's trying to tie a shoe. <laughs> you know, it's not easy. Just getting through life is a very tough situation. It's reality. It's my reality, as I just said. I don't believe in painting to be decorative. I believe in painting to be about life. I don't believe in doing a painting to hang it on the wall so it should look pretty. 
I have friends who do that and I have their work and that it's wonderful. It's lovely. I enjoy it. But that's not who I am. Uh, it's, it, the work has to be through my filter and, and who I am as a person. And while I enjoy flowers, I enjoy trees, I enjoy seascapes, and I incorporate them somehow in my painting, they are always, always secondary. They are always, in a sense, backdrops in the scenery. Things that prevail in my painting are the people and what they're, what they're about and what they're thinking about and what's happening to them. And maybe how they're responding to something in a very, you know, awkward situation or difficult situation or a situation they don't even know that they're responding to. But it's about life. Has any of your inspirations come from movies or novels that you you like or have been exposed to? I'm, I'm very well read. I mean, I've, I've read Jane Austen three times. I've read Tolstoy several times. I've read Elliot, you know. I don't read novels now. Uh, I, I read philosophy and theory now. I just read um, The Woman of A Street, which is a great read, by the way. I'm not interested in contemporary novels. I've read historic novels. I'm more interested now in opera. I view opera a lot. I have an opera library or I go online and watch opera. And I think, you know, the interesting thing is that opera is that opera is the people who wrote the libretto, some of them are really silly, but the silliness is about silly people. A lot of the, the great composers and librettists had a lot of insight into human nature and they were very astute in entertaining people and getting people through music and through, through the text and also through the stage presence in presenting a totality of reality. It can, it's a magical world, but it is the reality of both the composer and the librettist. In a sense, I could say it's unparalleled at this point in my life to that. I draw upon everything. Read Dickens, I watch movies, you know, I um, own the novels that I've read, even highbrow, lowbrow, whatever the terms you may want to have. But I, I do enjoy opera right now more so than, than reading novels. And I do prefer reading theory rather than reading novels. That's really interesting. I, I wouldn't have guessed opera. <laughs> you know, I've loved opera since I'm a small child. I've listened to opera, um, Texaco Theater, on the radio, Texaco Radio Theater on Saturday afternoons. I would listen to that as a child in grammar school. Wow. I know, I was a very unusual child. It's okay. All my, all my friends were doing other stuff, stuff and you know, relatives were doing other things. I would be listening to opera, and I always liked opera. I have, you know, for Wagner's Ring Cycle, I have four different ring cycles. Mm -hmm. I have seven versions of De Rosenkavalier. Mm -hmm. You know, I have so many different, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been collecting them for years, absolutely mm -hmm. years. And for, you know, when, when I, want a gift from someone, I say, give me a gift certificate and I'll buy an opera. How did you discover that oil paints create a visual tempo and expressive visuality that is so key to your pieces? It's how the eye reads, how your eye is reading something. If you, um, if you take the oil paints and depending upon the brush you use, and depending upon the amount of oil on the brush mm -hmm. and the brush strokes that you have, you can take one color and it can go to, to a multitude of different approaches and on the canvas. Mm -hmm. And how you paint, how, the, how, you, how you want the eye to read those brush strokes of that color and that brush, and there are many different brushes, is, is how you can create a tempo. You can create smoothness, or you can create, through an impasto, you can create uh, something that's, that's very lively. But depending upon where you want to have the eye fall, and how long you want the eye to rest on that section, you build your tempo. Mm -hmm. You may want the eye to go over one section easily. You may want the eye to stop and rest, and think about it a little bit more. So it's, it's up to how you put the, can the paint on the canvas with the brush, how thick you put it on, the way you put it on, how you manipulate the, put the pigment with the different brushes. <laughs> because I can have, I can, in fact, I, I have a painting I did with a lot of blacks that I tinted down to very, very light colors. And then I would do a whole body person with clothing and, and from that black in different shades. 
and you would never know it's the same color just in shit and tints but the way in which it's put on the pigment is put on the canvas with the different brushes for the different sections of the painting is what matters really cool to learn about as i said i had to learn how to paint and um i i learned how to paint by, by no one telling me what to do but mm -hmm. by making by trial and ever making a lot of mistakes yeah and scraping off a lot of pigment figuring out your technique as you went along yeah no yeah that's that's right and and, and as i said i'm very happy i was able to do that How has your time as the deputy director of the Cincinnati Art Museum influenced your artistic process? Or how has your artistic process changed since you have been able to devote your time to painting following the position? Okay, so I'll, I'll go back to Cincinnati. Cincinnati was one of, muse one of other museums that I worked at, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and also in art-related areas. Uh, I was vice president of Pratt Institute vice president of the Museum of Art and Design. I worked at the Brooklyn Museum, at the Whitney Museum, wow. and I worked for a long time at NYU. In lumping this all together, it's not just the Cincinnati Art Museum. Mm -hmm. It's dealing with kids, it's dealing with staff, and it's, my job was, was, was to write grants. But then I segued my way up to bringing in the money and doing the PR and doing the outreach for all these organizations. I essentially was an administrative position mm -hmm. and an administrative position very different from being hands-on even though you know in my higher up positions my a lot of positions I would you know work with curators and grant, grant applications for their work um, they did they did the creative end, and I did the administrative end so I never I never could get my hands on I could have I could have input you know into, into yeah that's a, that's a good idea we could raise money for that exhibition or that exhibition will never fly you know keep working on it maybe in five years we can raise money for it mm -hmm. but the administrative end is is an entity unto itself it would totally spend me at the end of the day because it was just so difficult uh, and you know in, in many instances it was 24 7 position depending upon you know what was going on so how has my life been different is that i always painted when i was working for the decades that i worked always painted I could never really paint the way I wanted to paint and give it the attention that I had to give it. Yeah. But I kept my hand in it and I didn't lose it. I didn't, and I learned and I developed things. And going back and looking over when I retired, I went back and look over, looked over everything. Essentially, you know, the, people say that, you know, you, you do the same thing again and again and again. And it's true. The thing, a lot of the things that I was interested in 20, 30, 40 years ago, I'm interested in now, I'm putting on the canvas. It's just that it's more sophisticated. It's more mature. I think that uh, I had a wonderful professor at Rutgers who, who really helped me, uh, John Goodyear. And he said to me, I had a lot of really good professors. You know, Jeff Hendricks was another great one. But John said to me that if, you know, if you go out, this is when I was graduating from, from MFA, if you go out and you have as many experiences as you can get, possibly get, the more experiences you get, he said, you'll, your work will be richer. Just have a lot of experiences. And he was right. And so I think a lot of the experiences that I had in working with people from gazillionaires, billionaires, to, to people who uh, you know, really were, were hard pressed for their next dime, to people who were creative, to people who were horrible, people who were wonderful, people who were generous, people who were stingy, all types of people. The people that I worked with were straight out of a Dickens novel or out of a Tolstoy novel. Learning from those people enabled me to do a lot of the work that I do today. Wow. And enabled me to put together, as the, as the saying goes, grist from your mill. It gave me a lot of content for how to put my stories and my narratives together on campus. And so I'm doing it now. I'm pulling it all together. That's really interesting how almost a non-art experience and an administrative role can add so much inspiration to your work. Absolutely. If you're going to be an artist, I don't think you choose to be an artist. I think, you know, I think there, there's a, um, a section in Demeister Singer where this young woman is saying, 
you know, she if she could choose something, she would choose one way, but she couldn't choose that one way. She had to do, do something else because she was chosen. And I think if you're going to be an artist, you know, it's an all consuming effort. And you have to know how to balance your real life along with being an artist, but you have to give so much to art. You have to be chosen to be an artist. You can't choose to be an artist. You're, you're, there's something within you, there's a drive within you that is completely irrational. It doesn't make sense. When I went back to school after nine years, I went to Douglas College. I was in, in a liberal arts curriculum. I, I majored in studio art. I didn't have a portfolio. I didn't have anything to give. I just knew I had to be an artist. I just knew this was something I was driven to do. And it's something that I'm driven to do now. It doesn't make sense. I have hundreds of big paintings and I don't know where, what to do with or where to put them. And instead of doing a lot of going on vacations, I will buy paint, I will buy canvas, I will buy brushes. You, you're just, it's, it's a compulsion, it's an obsession, it's whatever you want to call it. You could say you're neurotic, you could say you're not a very, you know, well-balanced person, but I think I am a very well balanced person. I've got my feet on the ground. I know what I'm doing. I'm doing art. I have no choice, but I'm doing art. And as difficult as it is, I'm not only resigned to what I'm doing, I feel fulfilled in what I'm doing. And art is one of the few places to me in life that one can be free. One can be free to do anything one wants on that campus. Absolutely. No one can tell you what to do. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of the ultimate freedoms in the world. And that is a blessing to have. So I feel that I'm a very fortunate person to be able to paint.